we actually have our own work to implement. I mean, the, the downside is, if they changed a lot, I guess we could have said, well, now it's your mission statement, your, your uh, values and so forth, and let us, let us know how that works up. But, you know, they, they, they tricked us. They accepted it as we gave it to them. And then they said, be sure to tell us how it's coming. So there will be a need for me to do regular reports back to them. Now, they're, they're excited by it, too. It's not a negative there at all, but I just mean to say that we can't get away with announcing uh, a great vision for ourselves and then leaving it somewhere um, on a shelf, not ever to be touched or implemented. The vision statement is not, was never intended as its own end, and, but, but as a means to an end. And so it really doesn't mean very much unless we actively engage. And we'll do this together. Uh, I'm not here to announce a lot of things that uh, I'm going to order you to do because, first of all, you would let me know what I could do with that, and then uh, and it wouldn't be polite. And then it only works if we can do it together. We, we created the vision statement together. We'll do the implementation together. But I, I want to put it in context because th this is not a, a trivial thing. And I hope by the end of the afternoon, that is to say in 45 minutes or so, I don't mean we're going to go all the way to 6 o'clock um, because I'd be by myself by then. Um, but I, I hope by the end of the afternoon that you will agree that this, this in fact, is quite uh, consequential. So if we do this right, if we collectively embrace our own vision, I think it's fair to say that we will change not just Roger Williams University and not just Rhode Island. We will redefine what it means to have a higher education institution in this country. And, I, and that's a very grandiose statement to make, but I'm going to come back to you and try and demonstrate that that, in fact, is an accurate statement. Today, we're rolling this out um, with the faculty and staff of this university. But next week, we are having a press conference at the Roger Williams National Memorial, kind of an appropriate place for us to be, um, with the governor and Mayor Lorza of Providence. And what we think is going to be a pretty consequential rollout. I don't want to surprise you by that if, if you think this is the only time it's going to be talked about. We're actually going to talk about it in the broader public, why it is consequential, what we're doing here at Roger Williams, to the state of affairs in Rhode Island, and obviously to get the mayor and the governor present, um, we've had to persuade them that it was worth their time. So, and I, again, think that you will see once we're done today that, yeah, we've got something useful to say to both of those people. Um, I thought a lot about how to put this together today, and, and it's, it's a little bit tricky because there's quite a bit to say, and I've got to be able to weave it together in some way that makes some sense. So we can look at this from a highly pragmatic standpoint. We can say, what is it that, that we need to do in the most pragmatic way? We could also say, yeah, but that doesn't sound all that, that great. How about if we, if we go on beyond that and we talk about what's the right thing to do? What is it we should be doing as an institution? And even then, I think we can go one step past that and say, what is the aspirational thing we can do? What's, what's the home run? So I'm going to go through these um, in that order. And at, when we start with a highly pragmatic, um, we can look at it from the standpoint of what's in the best interest of Roger Williams University, or what's in the best interest of our students, or what's in the best interest of society at large. And the good news is, it turns out, the answer same set of answers to all three questions. And I'm going to try and show you how that's so. We, in other words, we don't have to choose between what's good for us and what's good for our students, or what's good for our students and what's good for society. It's all the same thing. So if you look at it from the standpoint of Roger Williams, we would say, well, to be very pragmatic about it, we have to make sure that we recruit and retain enough students every year to meet our budgetary requirements. You know, because without that, the rest of it is just a lot of hot air. We have to be able to manage the process where we lure in enough students and expose them to the wonderful things that are going on here to just meet our budgetary needs. And in recent years, we've learned quite a bit about that process. It's changing. So at the moment, 
the single most important thing that we know from surveys that students tell us about why it is they choose a particular campus is the strength of the major. And I guess they were told that's the right answer and they tick that box because that doesn't make any sense. How do they do that? Have you noticed a lot of people Googling you lately and finding out where you got your highest degree? Uh, people searching out your publications? I mean, the fact is that students really have no way of assessing the strength of the major. And besides which, they're going to change the major as soon as they get here. So why are they bothering to do that? Really, I think what they're saying is, how do they feel about their initial interaction with the people when they came to open houses or accepted students' days, the people that they were talking to, most especially the faculty? Although not just the faculty, but most especially the faculty. Did they, was that a good conversation? Did they feel at ease? Were they, were they happy with the nature of the conversation? And I, I really think that, and so what it comes down to is, I really think this is a way of saying that from a student's perspective, did it feel like a good fit for me? Am I going to be able to work in this environment? Will I be successful? And the quick answer to that question is, you people are doing an absolutely outstanding job. Outstanding job. We were almost at 50% this year with respect to the, the number of students, or the percentage of students, who came to accepted students' days and then enrolled with us in the fall. 50%. Now, these are students, in some instances, that are going to three and four or even more campuses. 50% is a very large slice for us to get. I, I fear for the rest of the campuses because they couldn't possibly have done as well. We already took away half the class. So the secret then is if we get people to come to an accepted student's day, man, are we good or what? Because we're really gonna knock a home, a home run with those people. The downside is that we don't get enough of them to come in the first place. So I was just looking at numbers from last year. We had about 2,000 students and parents, well, 2,000 students, family members were additional, who came to open houses. And we had about 1,400 who came to ASDs. And they are not necessarily the same people, by the way. And so, because some people don't visit the campus until they know the campus has accepted them. It's surprising to me, I've called students to give them the good news that they would accept it at Roger Williams. And then I'll ask them, have you visited the campus? Well, no. Oh, OK. So that explains why you're just rhapsodic with joy that I've told you you've been accepted. Um, but they're going to visit the campus um, now that they know they've been accepted. Why fall in love with a place that turned you down, I guess is their theory. Um, so OK, that's fine. But you do the math on this and say, let's just round and say we get half of all of the people at ASD. That's 1,400 divided by two, 700 students except we want 1,100. So where are the other 400 coming from? And the answer has been, this is like the dark matter of the universe. They just sort of show up in small, stealthy numbers. They sneak in in the dead of night, and just enough of them show up that we make our numbers. And, and but that is a really scary proposition. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they've come from. They just arrive, and, and some years they don't. So part of our problem has been that there's enough uncertainty in this process and enough uncertainty based in part on the declining or the changing demographics, especially in the Northeast, declining numbers of high school graduates, um, that dealing with that kind of an environment makes me extremely nervous. So in the last four years, we've been well over our target two years and under our target two years. And that just creates a lot of budgetary challenges because you know, it's plus or minus 5%. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot, but man, that, that impacts the budget a lot. So if we can figure out how to reduce that variation by locking in students in a little different way, I think we're going to serve ourselves very nicely. So when we, we look at um, I want two, two points. First issue is, I think we have to accept the idea that we are all recruiters of students. We hear all the time that I walked onto the campus and the first person I met was a groundskeeper and I asked directions and darned if he didn't walk me to where I needed to go. Man, would that, was I impressed. I think we, we hear a lot from parents and students about what a terrific job 
the student that was doing the tour guy, the tour did with that student. I sort of fell in love with the person and the, and the campus at the same time. I mean, it's not just high level stuff where they, they need to talk directly to a faculty member. The strength of the major, they say, is important to them. But really what they're saying is, did I have a really great experience with the people that I met on the campus? And so we all impact the decision-making process of these students. And I think if we accept that, um, then, then we will be just fine. And it's a lot of work. Um, and in order to have more students coming to accepted students' days and more students coming to open houses, you know, we probably need to have more of both. And, and, and yet it's a big imposition on people's weekends to do this, and I, I recognize that. But it would be folly for me to say, well, let's not work hard on the weekend and then find that we're well short of our target of students um, in the fall. So we're starting open houses really early this year, as in Saturday. And, um, and that's, it's important for us to incorporate today what it is that we're saying about ourselves so that we're all on message even as early as Saturday. So um, got to cover some material here this afternoon. So if the first thing that students are saying is the most important thing for me is the strength of major, right behind it in number two is a much more quantitative measure, and that's price. How much is it going to cost me? And I suspect that, in fact, this ends up being even more consequential than people say it is. It comes in the form of the size of my scholarship, my net price, what my parents have to say. So we know that this is the world we're living in, and in a competitive market where there are more seats than there are uh, bottoms to put in those seats, you know, there are winners and losers in this situation. Um, and on the one hand, you know, we've done a terrific job of holding the line on price. Just to remind you, we haven't raised our price for tuition since 2012. Uh, the board, by the way, has accepted the recommendation that we not raise it for the class of 2016. That'll be five years in a row at the same price unprecedented as far as I know anywhere in the country, especially when it's coupled with a lock-in for the four years that the students are here. But that by itself doesn't get it done because what we've learned this year is that the discount rate with our competitors continues to rise. They are the average discount rate a year ago for first-year students in private institutions in this country was 56%. They're giving away more than half of what they say they're taking in. Ours is 44% this year. And we are not going to get into a situation where we try and keep pace because that's an arms race we'll lose. We just don't have deep enough pockets. So it's important on the one hand that we're as affordable as we can be, but if it's all about who can offer the best price, we don't win that one. Even if we won it among the privates, we wouldn't win it with the publics. So the answer then is we have to think in terms of, so what's the value? What are they getting for their money? How do we convince parents that the additional cost that we might represent is, is worth the price? And that's why we've been working on this collective statement so that we can say as precisely as, as we are able, here's the elevator speech, here's what it is that we're telling you that represents the value of a Roger Williams education. And, I, and I'm making that statement for a very specific reason. I don't want to talk about what's going on in a particular classroom. Um, I'm not going to try and sell the idea we have small classes because small classes by itself, well, a lot of people can say they have small classes. Um, what's going on in those classes? What's going on outside the classes? What represents the totality of the Roger Williams experience? And if we can do that in a cogent and convincing manner, we will have all the students we need, and then some. So. If we, if we turn to the issue of, I, I guess I should make one more uh, statement here. We're starting to see this year the results coming in from certain of the campuses in the Northeast that are feeling the impact of um, the smaller number of the high school graduates. So in the last week or so, uh, College of St. Rose in Albany has announced that they are somewhere north of $6 million of deficit, 
which is causing, that's a small campus, that's, that's a, it's a big number. Uh, LaSalle down in Philadelphia, not LaSalle, LaSalle in Philadelphia is laying people off because they've missed their target big time. SUNY, the SUNY system is down three and a half percent in the last five years. That's a public uh, set of campuses and that's just a direct reflection of the fact the high school classes are getting smaller. So our challenge then is to get, to maintain our numbers, we have to have a bigger slice of a smaller pie and, and, that's, and that's where this uh, where we come to grips with this. And the, and the good news is we've got a plan to do that. So it's not like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? I mean, we, we were thinking ahead. This conversation we had last year is putting us in a very good place, as I will get to in just a moment. So the best interest of the students, how do we, how do we discern what that is? If, should, should that be our focus? And, and, and how would that take us in a different direction than the best interest of the, of the university? Well, what we're finding from national surveys of freshmen, because these national surveys are done every year, what is your reason for going to college in the first place? And a decade ago or two decades ago, students would talk about, well, I, I, I want to learn more about myself. I want to learn more about the world I live in. It's to get a job. Today, it's to get a job. And you know, I think our reaction as a learning institution is one of, just this side of horror. Oh my God, we've become transactional. We, you pay us money, we give you the, what you need to get a job and, and we're done. But how, how in heaven's name does that represent the education that we think we have long been providing? But parents talk in terms of ROI, return on investment. Good Lord. Um, we're like buying stock. I mean, I don't understand that kind of thinking, but that's where we are. That's, that's, that's what's going on right now. And I don't think we can ignore that. I think we have to deal with that as a reality as much as it may offend us. So, but it doesn't mean we have to give up everything else that we think is valuable in order to accomplish that. So, when we focus on the interests of our students, there was a very interesting survey, actually a set of surveys done by the American Association of, of Colleges and Universities over the last several years, interviewing uh, people in the, in, in, in the C-suite and you know, the executives of organizations saying, so, so how are we doing here in higher education? And, and the, the result was interesting. What we heard back from, the, well, I say we, but collectively um, we got back was that they think that we do quite a good job with respect to specific skills. So if they're hiring an engineer, they're hiring an accountant, they're hiring an architect, I don't mean us personally. I'm saying, uh, of course it would be true for, for us, but just in general across the country, you do a pretty good job higher education when you are training professional people. But where it breaks down is inside the marketplace itself because your students don't communicate well in orally or in writing. They don't get along particularly well with people who are different from themselves. They, um, they're not great analysts. Um, they, they've got a very funny attitude regarding um, their responsibilities to the, to the entity that's hired them. You know, what, five days a week, really? Five? I gotta come five? I, oh, okay, and, and my first raise is when? Uh, so what's been happening is the millennials have been losing their jobs. They've been, they've been being fired because they just didn't have what the marketplace was looking for. Not in terms of their specific skills, but just in terms of their capacity to work within that environment. And so the response from, from people has been, who are hiring people, is we're only going to hire people with experience. Because we need to know that you've actually worked in an environment that's real as opposed to being in the bubble you lived in for 22 years because we're not the ones that are going to go ahead and civilize you. Somebody else will do that. Um, thank you very much. So that would be us because there's nobody else to do this. Um, well, the good news is that, of course, we've been focusing a lot of this project-based learning and that's where they learn these skills. That's where they learn collaboration. That's where they learn negotiation. That's where they learn deadlines. That's, that's when they learn that not everybody likes their ideas, even though their mother always did. You know? And so, they're, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more of the real world. So, we're doing, we're, we're, we already are responding very well to what employers say they need. 
by making sure that our graduates actually have relevant experience within their field before they graduate. And our commitment now is to make that universal. We want every one of our students to have the opportunity for some type of project-based learning experience. It doesn't have to be CPC. There's lots of other things that we do, but that's part of where we're going to go. We also need to be thinking uh, from the standpoint of working adults. We've, we've always, we started as a campus in Providence with working adults. We've always had a role to play there. And as you know, we're expanding our footprint in Providence. We'll be occupying the new building in April and May of this coming year. And, um, and Jamie Scurry and her people have done a great job um, of expanding the number of uh, programs that they have, many of which are not degree granting or even credit offering. They're, they're just getting people in place, closing the skills gap, and getting them ready for the world that exists today. And this is very much focused on Rhode Islanders getting improved skills. And that's one of the reasons why the governor and the mayor want to be part of the press conference they're running, because that's music to their ears. Today, the governor announced a plan to retain more college graduates by offering money for a down payment on a house if they would stay. And that only works if there are actual graduates that want to stay in Rhode Island. And when we move people out into the broader community and get them ex more experienced and familiar, even though 85% of our students are from other states, some number of them stay. And we think that number can grow, and we think that's an asset to everybody, uh, the students as, as well as, uh, as Rhode Island. If we look at the best interests of society, and we'll use Rhode Island as just the local society, they want, society wants the same thing. They want graduates that have experience. They, they, they want to know that our students, or students in general, have met the people and organizations of Rhode Island because that would strengthen the Rhode Island economy. They want to, I think, hope to see that students also have more of a communitarian focus. And one of the ancillary benefits from the work that we're doing in the community, and, and it, it, whether it's, it's Casey Ferrara or, or Arnold Robinson or any of the people that are taking students off the campus and into the broader community, is that students are, are understanding that the organizations they work with, the people they work with, are actually grateful for that, that experience they've had, that they're grateful to the students. And that is, that is something that students relish doing. Uh, a, an idealistic student loves to know that they're making a difference in someone's life. And we're giving them that experience. And it's, it's not about getting a great job. They, they want that too. But it's very much about doing something that's meaningful and useful to them. And I think the law school is, has done a terrific job of this over the years because we can point to people who have worked in the pro bono collaborative, working on, in an immigration clinic, who found that work so satisfying that they set up shop as an immigration lawyer. And it's the whole public purpose of our law school, the focus that that law school's had for a very long time. They are doing what I hope we can do with the undergraduates and, and create that notion that collectively we can make the world a better place as opposed to I need to grab mine and run, which has been the prevailing view for too long for too many people um, who are moving into society and getting that first job. Well, it's got to be more than just jobs in the economy. I mean, that's, we'll take that as a given, but let's not stop there. So let's think about what's the right thing to do. So I want to make reference to something I've, I've, I think I've talked about before, I've certainly blogged about it, and that's the, the study that Gallup did a couple of years ago, the Gallup organization, uh, when they interviewed 30,000 college graduates. And they wanted to find out, so we've got some ideas about what makes for a, a wonderful life, uh, but we want to find out from you just how that's playing out. So we've got some specific ways we're going to break these questions down, and we're going to find out from all these graduates um, just how things are going for them. And they looked at two things. They looked at engagement in the workplace. Are, are people engaged? Did this to say, they, are they 
Are they gratified by their working experience? Do they feel rewarded by it? Do they feel empowered by it? Are they enjoying themselves? Are they, are they not engaged? I'm, I'm doing it to, for the paycheck and, and uh, that's okay, um, but you know, it's just a job. Or are they actively disengaged? I'm trying to sabotage the organization because they've treated me shabbily. And so what they found was, of all these 30,000 college graduates, the percentage that, were, that said they were engaged was 39%. Less than half of the college graduates are finding what they're doing rewarding, which is kind of awful. You go to college in order to improve your lot in life, but, but somehow they've fallen into a situation where they're, they're just kind of chugging along as best they can or are actively working to uh, undercut the organization. That's, that's not a high number. So that's the, that's the workplace engagement measure. The other measure is what they call well-being. And well-being, um, and the measure here is are you thriving, struggling, or suffering? Um, and what you'd like to know is that you're thriving. I'm, I'm great. So well-being refers to five categories. Um, purpose. Do you have a purpose in life? Often it's your job. But if you have purpose, that's good. Um, financial, do you make enough money so that you know, every month isn't a struggle? What about social? Are you, are you, um, do you have a happy home life? What about community? Are you embedded in your community in some useful, rewarding way, whether it's, it's church or civic groups? And, and finally, physical health. Are, are, are you feeling pretty good physically? Well, the percentage of these 30,000 college graduates that are thriving in all five categories is 11% which is not a great number. So then the question, this is the important part, then the question was, well, is there any way we can correlate what happened to you at college with which category you fall into? Are there things that enhance the likelihood that you're going to be thriving in your life, that you'll have a great job and a great life? And the answer is, oh yeah. Six things. Six things that either did or did not happen while they were in college that greatly increase by an order of magnitude the likelihood that you're going to have a great job and a great life. And, and the, the good news is we do these things. We've, we've done them for a long time, but we just aren't doing them as purposefully as we need to. So I'm going to talk about the percentage of, of graduates who strongly agreed that they had the following. Did you have a professor who cared about me as a person? Answer, 27%. So three quarters of the college graduates said, there never was a time when I felt I had a professor who cared about me as a person. Well, you know, you can understand how that would be true at a great big university where they have 300 people in the classroom. I don't think it's true at a place like Roger Williams. In fact, I know it's not true. 27%. A professor who made the student excited about learning. They did better here. 63% said, yeah, but still, more than a third. No, no professor ever made me excited about learning. I know we do better than that. A mentor who encouraged the student to pursue his or her dreams. A mentor. Now, mentorship is not something that you can make happen. You create opportunities for mentorship, but you can't say, okay, there's your mentor. Go ahead, start mentoring here. Um, you're a mentee, you, you receive mentoring, and you're a mentor, you give it and just make it all happen. It doesn't work that way. We create opportunities for people to find mentors, and they're not always faculty. Very often they're, they're uh, staff. Sometimes they're just older students. But these are the things that happen on a, or can happen on a campus that is residential and where the classes are small and where there's a great ratio of faculty and staff to students. And they become hugely predictive for long-term success that goes beyond just getting a good job, having a good and rich life. There are three more. An internship or job where the student was able to apply what she or he learned in the classroom. We take that today as kind of routine. 29% had 
had that. Now, these are people that have already graduated, so we would assume this is happening more commonly, but we, again, we have a much higher percentage than that. And, and one that was quite interesting, active involvement with extracurricular activities and organizations. So sports, student clubs. One of the differences that happens at a place like Roger Williams in comparison where, with where I worked before in public institutions is that we spend literally twice as much of our budget on student affairs as does the typical public. Because we're residential, we need the programming, we need the number of people. We, 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 this, the extracurricular part of the education is huge in a residential campus, residential private campus. And so the number of clubs we have, the number of sports teams that we have create opportunities for leadership in these organizations that it turns out, again, hugely predictive of, of a great outcome in life. But only 20% of those 30,000 college graduates said they had active involvement with a student club or organization when they were an undergraduate. And finally, a project that took a semester or more to complete. Well, we, we do that as well. 52% of the graduates said they had that. But what's interesting is when you put them all together, there are six of these things. They all push in the same direction. They all create better outcomes in life. The number who strongly agreed they had all six, 3%. 3%. Now, we, we do these things now. We, if we did them in a more purposeful sense, we're in the position to say an independent organization, the Gallup organization, has told us what can happen at a college that is predictive of long-term success in life, and we're embracing that on our campus. We do, we do it, we have done it, we will continue to do that. And it's interesting, this progr program has been out for two years, this study's been out for two years. I know of one other university right now that's saying, yeah, we're gonna do that. They've looked at this and said, that's interesting, yeah. We're, we're doing what we're doing. So if we can be more purposeful in what it is that we're doing with our students, both in the classroom and outside, we're in a position to be able to say to them when they show up here as prospective students on Saturday, and I'm gonna do this, by the way, man, if you come here, here's what we got for you. And that's where I think we begin to separate from the rest of higher education. Because if we can't differentiate ourselves as an institution from the organizations, the schools that we compete with, they will decide where to go based on price. And I've already told you, we can't win that fight. So we, the more that we differentiate ourselves, the more distinctiveness we have, the better off we're going to be. So we've talked about what we want as a campus what students want as a campus, what society wants from us. And now I've just told you what it is that students need. They don't know they need it, but they will long term. And we, if we give them more than what they say they want, which is just tell me what I need to get a good job, and we tell them no, we're going to do that. But in addition to that, we're going to give you what you need to have a great life. And what parent doesn't want a great life for their kids? So. If we look now then to society, what does society need? We know what society wants. Society says we want employees, we want a stronger economy. What does it need? Society needs leaders. Society needs volunteers. Society needs humanitarians. Society needs, needs communitarians, people that are invested in the community and the better, better life for the community. It doesn't just need skilled workers. So again, the things that work for a, for a student as an adult to have a great life are exactly what society needs. It goes beyond the idea, I, it's all about me, I'm just going to get my share and then to hell with everybody else. It's about how can we make our society stronger. We've gotten very selfish as a society and, and the, these are ways we can turn that around and, and appeal to the idealism of young students who want to be part of making the world a better place. We need to engage with them on that and say, we're going to help you do exactly that, because we, we believe that too. So we can put Roger Williams on a solid economic foundation. 
we can ensure that students have not only what they want, but also what they need, and we can strengthen the economic fabric of this state. But we can aspire to more than that. We can create what Ernie Boyer called the new American university, and we can be very proud of what we do. So I think all of you know something about Ernie Boyer, just to remind you, he was the former chancellor of the SUNY system. He was the former commissioner of education in the US before there was a secretary of education. He was the former president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And in 1994, he wrote a hugely influential paper that nonetheless was ignored. People said, that's a great paper. Now go away. Um, because he called for the creation of the new American college. And what he meant by that was his strong belief was that American higher education sort of lost its way after World War II, that it became overly focused on research because of the National Science Foundation, which was created in 1950 and the expansion of NIH. Now, he wasn't against research, but he, he, he said the things are, have gotten tilted the wrong way. We, at the big research universities, they don't care about undergraduate education anymore, and, and, and they should, and somebody should, and who's going to step forward to do this? And so it was pretty interesting. A, a couple of little tidbits first. You know, the first colleges here in the United States back in the colonial era were, were church-related. They were educating ministers and people of that particular faith who were going to work in the community. And it was Benjamin Franklin that said when he founded the University of Pennsylvania, no, that's not right. We're, we're going to engage with the Age of Enlightenment. We're going to do a different thing. So here's Benjamin Franklin, 1740 the purpose of the University of Pennsylvania as consisting in an inclination joined with an ability to serve mankind, one's country, friends, and family. Now, ignoring for a moment that kind of highfalutin language, what he's saying is a publicly purposed institution. And, and many, many, most of the universities that followed for the next 200 years had that same philosophy. When Daniel Coit Gilman gave his inaugural address at the first research university in this country, which was Johns Hopkins, modeled on the German model, started as a graduate institution only, he said, universities should make for less misery among the poor, less ignorance in the schools, less bigotry in the temple, less suffering in the hospitals, less fraud in business, less folly in politics. Where is Daniel Coit Goodman when we need him? Um, that's what the first president of a major research university said, still very much focused on the idea that universities are serving a public good. So when Ernie Boyer wrote his paper in 1994, here's a couple of quotes from him. How can American higher education successfully contribute to national renewal? Is it possible for the work of the academy to relate more effectively to our most pressing social, economic, and civic problems? No one has taken up that banner. Well, I'm going to qualify that in just a minute. But not many schools have. And he went on to say, and this is a little, a little close, um, I'm troubled that many now view the campus as a place where professors get tenured and students get credentialed. And what I find most disturbing is the growing feeling in this country that higher education is a private benefit, not a public good. And if ever we've gotten in trouble in higher education, it's because we have been told that. And that's the reason for disengagement by state government in public higher education. Why should we subsidize what is a private benefit? Pay for it yourself and keep us out of it. And finally, um, Boyer quotes a colleague, universities cannot afford to remain shores of affluence, self-importance, and horticultural beauty at the edge of island seas of squalor, violence, and despair. Man, I had to go and have a small scotch after I read that line. That, that's, that's really... Uh, th and there's one more quote I'll give you, which has nothing to do, but I just came across this, this great quote. It, because Boyer died a year after he wrote this paper. He's been dead for 20 years. But he was prescient because here is, 
he, he was he, talking about the appointment of politicians to lead uh, to, uh, to become university presidents. Not that that would ever happen. If, um, if you appoint political figures to these offices, you have more political voices being heard, but they're being heard already. You need other voices. Without the voices with strong academic credentials behind them, you can even imagine a time in the future when a politicized university administration and a politicized board of trustees would be hugely impatient with academic freedom. Well, the future is now, baby, if you live in Wisconsin, because that's the world we're seeing developing. So Boyer, Boyer was prescient. There is one thing that came out of his talk. Um, there was an organization that was formed the next year um, that is now called the New American Colleges and Universities, because most of them are universities. It's a group of two dozen campuses that are committed to connecting a liberal arts education, professional studies, and community engagement. That's their thing, two dozen. It's an invitation-only organization. We were invited to join this summer, and we did. So we are now part of that group. But the good news is they haven't quite figured it out themselves yet either. So it's not like they have all the answers. They have the right set of values, but they're not at any, in any means at the end of that equation. We are in a position to do it better than anybody has done it to date. So four years ago, next month, when I gave my inaugural address, I said the following. So what I am presenting is not a pipe dream. It is achievable. We lack only a collective aspirational vision and the collect collective commitment to see that vision realized. Well, folks, we now have a collective aspirational vision. And I think it's time for us to commit to seeing that vision realized. Thank you very much. A couple of things are going to happen. Uh, as you walk out, we have suitable for framing um, the new vision mission statement. And you may look at the light standards that will look different to you now than they did when you walked in. I'll just leave that mysterious statement alone. But facilities have been working while we've been inside. Thanks again. <laughs>